Yes, I think as uh, probably I, I've come to know this about myself as an adult, that one of the things that my brain does particularly well is link unconnected ideas, link things that, that aren't on uh, at the face of it related. Uh, and I'm very good at that. At school, I used to get into trouble for that because it meant that I would not necessarily be doing the homework that I'd been given. I'd be doing something different. But once you see the pattern, you can't unsee it. And certainly listening to Catherine, there was a pattern. There was a pattern of restlessness. There was a pattern of not staying with the job for long enough. Um, and that restlessness continued throughout her career until she decided to do something on her own. And probably if you have restlessness in terms of where you are in your job at the moment, that might be an indicator that you need to start something on your own. Anyway, have a listen, see what you think of Catherine's journey. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Catherine. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm really well, thank you very much. Um, happy January. Happy New Year to you. Oh, it's still January, so we can still <laughs> just about say Happy New Year. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your journey and your story and what you've been up to over a number of years. And as some amazing work that you're doing. So the first question that I ask all my guests, and they probably know by now the ones that I listen regularly, but I still ask it. And that is, would you mind sharing a little bit about your personal life, where you were born, a bit about your education, where you now live, um, share a bit about your family if you wish to, but you don't have to, then any hobbies and interests, just so people get a sense of Catherine and her personal, a little bit about her personal, and then we'll go into the into the business world stuff. Okay. Um, I was born in the West Midlands and I've lived here on and off um, uh, a lot of my life, but I've had the privilege of living and working abroad as well, which has been a fantastic opportunity. Um, mm. I have five younger brothers, so I'm... Um, some would say quite bossy. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm You're the pioneer. To... You're the yeah. pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was my game and my rules and yes. that's how we were playing. <laughs> and that's uh, how it's always been. But it's certainly given me um, a huge amount of confidence. My mum often says that I couldn't have got my militant feminism from her but I think it, it must have come from that and and the other women that I grew up around when I was young um I've been very privileged to be around strong women and and men who appreciate strong women so mm. I've been able to really do the things that I want to with my life I've never feared those things because I've always had that innate self-confidence mm. um given to me by by the people around me, so I'm, I'm very privileged to have had that. Um, I currently live in London, um, but uh, I, I have a lot of work um, in Europe at the moment, so I'm, I'm there a lot of the time as well. I, um, I, I loved school. I had a great time at school, went to um, a number of different schools, um, just just loved it, just couldn't get enough of it. Was not was never a particularly amazing a star student, but just love learning, love knowledge, love finding out new things. I was probably the person that the teachers hated because I was the one with all of the questions, <laughs> just going, <laughs> why, why, why is it like this? Um, and, and I'm still like that now as an adult. I, I can't get enough information. My, I'm standing here today surrounded by books. I'm literally just surrounded by them. Um, because I think there's just, you, you can never have enough knowledge and enough insight mm. into the way the world works. Wow. And so in terms of education, did you did you kind of go to dizzy heights of university and other things like that? I did. I did. Yes. Um, I, I went to university as, as a, a youngster um, 
without really the faintest idea what it was that I wanted to do or to study, but the university seemed the right thing to do, so mm. I did, and I, and I loved it. I mean, I don't really use what I studied particularly, but the life lessons and, and the experiences and things that I had were phenomenal. Mm. Um, subsequently, I've gone back and done a master's, and I'm currently doing a PhD. Wow. And and then in what are you doing your PhD? Uh, in behaviour change. So, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later in the interview, I guess. Mm. But um, my work has changed over the years. And as part of my relentless thirst for, for knowledge, I want to understand more about how things work. So my PhD is looking at how you achieve behaviour change in careers for young people. So how you open their minds, how you take them through that process of mm. Accessing information, understanding the architecture of choice, um, avoiding choice overload, all of those kind of things. So it's based on a model for the NHS's behaviour change. Wow. Oh, yeah, I'd love to get into that. That's fascinating. <laughs> so so after your original kind of university and studies, um, how did you then decide what your first job was going to be or did you already have a job whilst you're in university as well? Um, I had lots of jobs while I was at university. I think I probably worked in every single bar and restaurant in the West Midlands mm. um, at, at one point or another. But I knew that hospitality wasn't particularly what I wanted to do. It was just that the hours obviously lend themselves to um, to university life. Um, yes. I, my first job was, was not something that I planned to do. It was... Uh, job advert that I responded to and and um it was working with a construction company mm -hmm. bizarrely to come sort of full circle to where I am now but um had not really known much about construction wasn't really particularly interested in construction um but um found the opportunity and and the the boss who was the manager of that particular team to be so inspiring that uh, that was something I did to begin with and Cut my teeth to learning all sorts of things that really had very little to do with construction, but, yeah. but gave me a, an insight into the world of work. And and what, you know, what was the attraction? It wasn't the industry at the time, but it was the attraction of the role that you went for? Yes, I think as uh, probably I, I've come to know this about myself as an adult, that one of the things that my brain does particularly well is link unconnected ideas, link things that, that aren't on uh, at the face of it related. Uh, and I'm very good at that. At school, I used to get into trouble for that because it meant that I would not necessarily be doing the homework that I'd been given. I'd be doing something different. But once you see the pattern, you can't unsee it. And as an adult, I'm actually very comfortable that, that that's how my brain works and, and I'm quite happy about it. I didn't know that consciously when I took this first job, but it was very clear to me that the things that the company were asking for were just the surface of what actually needed to be done. And I could see that there was so much more there and that that really inspires me. So it wasn't particularly around the sector. It no. was it was from a very personal point of view that the opportunity was such that I knew I could make it my own. Mm. Brilliant. And how long did you do that for? <clears throat> I was there for about two years. Um, I have never actually worked anywhere longer than that because I also have a really short attention span and <laughs> it's probably one of the reasons I'm not an employee anymore because I'm, I'm not very good at it. Yes. But in my time there, um, some of your listeners may know Joel Blake, OBE, um, the, uh, the amazing Midlands personality who does incredible things mm. uh, around recruitment and diversity and things. Uh, and he and I worked together. Um, at that company and so we've known each other for an embarrassingly long time yes. um, but that was part of it I think for for me that that part of the fun was was the incredible people I got to work with wow wow okay then where so after two years where did you go to then uh, then I went to um, to a different company I, I changed sector Sim similar job um, in terms of broadly what it involved but uh, a more senior position mm -hmm. with on the face of it a bit more um, responsibility a bit more freedom a bit more opportunity uh, um, to influence things as it as it turned out it wasn't that at all um, and I think that, that there began the sort of demise for me a little bit of being an employee it mm. was uh, 
it was not an altogether fun experience. But again, I met some incredible people that I'm still in touch with now. So I'm very grateful to have made those connections through life because to me, uh, a job is simply what you make of it. If it's not right for you, it's like a relationship. It's okay to walk away from that. You don't have to stay and Mm. put up with something that makes you miserable. Um, and I don't, I, I'm quite flighty when it comes to those kind of things. If, if a job makes me unhappy, then I, I don't stay. Yeah. And I think, you know, lots of people would love to do that, don't they? Say, right, I'm not happy here. I'm going to go. But I always find it so interesting that the lead up to getting a role, you were always, I remember this about myself, you were desperate to get the job, you know, Mm. You you were desperate, like, oh, I really want to get the job. And once you go for the interview, you're nervous. And then you 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 get the letter or the phone call to say, yeah, you've got the job. You're going to start. You celebrate. And you go, yay, brilliant. And then you get into the job and it doesn't live up to <laughs> the, the kind of dream expectations you had about that job. And then you kind of go, actually, I don't like my boss. I don't like the people. <laughs> I don't like this. And th- this, I think, and it's something I've written about, not really spoken about, but I think the whole recruitment is just broken. You know, people can never make up their mind about a company, who to who they're going to work for in a couple of hours. And likewise for the organisation. But that's a whole other discussion, <laughs> which, which, will, which I don't want to get into <laughs> unless we want to. Um, but... So what, just one thing we didn't discuss, what were you doing in these companies that you, you were with and then I, ended up I not was, being happy? <laughs> I, uh, marketing broadly. So I was um, marketing manager and then marketing director. Right. Um, and I, I'm i not a particularly uh, creative person. I, I, mm. I mean, I guess I'd like to think I am, but I'm, I'm not a particularly artistic person. I'm not, I'm not that way inclined. So it was never on the beautiful design side of marketing. It was more of the, the, the strategy and the fundamental of the things. The practical, which, yeah. 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 The, pra- the implementation of stuff rather than the... Yes. And, and, and the research and the evidence and the data, that kind mm. of thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So you weren't happy. What did you do then? Uh, I left <laughs> I am, and there began a pattern of working for lots of people again never really for longer than a couple of years mm. but um, I I started to move out of purely marketing and move into all sorts of organizations doing different things so I worked for uh, management consultancies things like that people where actually the opportunity became more because I wasn't just responsible for creating something for my own team and my own company. Mm. I was actually selling that to to clients as well and helping as a fresh pair of eyes, someone to guide them. And that, that was interesting. There was, there was opportunity there, but you know, the, some of your listeners may be old enough to remember, um, financial crashes before the last one, um, that, uh, you know, sometimes even you can end up in a great job that, Unfortunately, the company doesn't doesn't stick around. Mm. Um, so I, I, I suppose I, I sort of I, I lost my interest in working for other people. It became a it took a while to get there, but I started to realise that I was strong enough in myself to do the things I wanted to do mm. to work for myself. And so, being an employee started to hold less and less appeal really um and about 2003 i decided that was that was enough that was enough (laughs) (laughs) so and and how old were you then when you discovered this catherine when you said i was in my 20s i was in my 20s yeah so Um, pretty young to to come to that conclusion so and when did you graduate um uh yeah and and, uh, before the millennium um yeah uh, uh i i I, I probably did come at it young, but I suppose I had a lot of experiences in a very short space of time. Yes. Um, because uh, I, as I say, I'd work for companies where it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And they were quite short jobs, some of them. Um, and then I had others where I was having a great time. And then the company went under and just started to think, OK, I think I can do this myself. And I think there's a bit more 
stability is probably the wrong word, but there's a bit more uh, flexibility, there's a bit more strength in being able to choose a number of clients that I work with mm. and then I'm not reliant on one of them to to be my all, to be my everything. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So when you, so what happened next then? So you said, right, I want to work and do something for myself. I'm not going to work for anybody else at that young age, although you'd had loads of experience. What, what, how did you decide to then do something and create something for yourself? Um, it, it was, uh, Partly me, but I'm I'm going to give this the full credit and say it was actually um, a particular lady, a particular personality that was involved. So mm. when I left the management consultancy, it was because it had um, gone under. Um, and so we were all given quite a substantial um, uh, payoff settlement mm -hmm. um, redundancy for, for the time. Anyway, from my late 20s, it was it was fantastic. Mm. Um, and I traveled a lot and went to a lot of places and okay, what do I want to do? Well, I, I think I'm, I'm good at marketing. I can, I can get results. I can make that happen. Mm -hmm. It's easy to me. So I will sell that as a consultant. I'll, I'll set up self-employed. Yeah. Um, I, I did that and sort of ticked along and, and didn't, didn't really achieve any great heights, but it was, it was perfectly acceptable. Um, until I got a call one day from a lady from the NHS who said, I've heard about your company. I've heard about what you do. Um, I think you should come and work for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't know anything about healthcare. I don't really know anything about the NHS. I'm not sure I could, I could help you. As it transpires, having known this lady since, it turns out that once she's decided something, there's no point arguing mm -hmm. because she, she knows what she's talking about and that's all there is to it. But at the time, obviously, I didn't know that. So I was sort of backtracking a little bit and saying, I'm not quite sure that I can be all the things that you need me to be. And she said, yes, I'm absolutely convinced that you can. So come and sit and talk to me. Yes. So we set up a meeting and I went over to see her and she said, um, the kind of marketing that I was doing at the time, she said, this is what we in the NHS call behavior change. It's a big part of public health. Um, it's about helping people to make different choices. Mm. This was a new team that she was setting up um, in the NHS. And she said, I want you to come and be part of my team. And you're going to head up special projects um, as, as a contractor, as a consultant. Um, but you'll, you'll head this up. And I, in a relatively short space of time, just got involved in some of the most incredible and exciting projects that were so varied, so different. Yeah. But it gave me a whole insight to how my marketing was really being applied because the part about making shareholders rich never really that bothered about that sadly for a lot of my employee uh, employers would, mm. would that that was not enough to drive me but this side from healthcare about actually helping people to make different choices in their lives I could really see the direct correlation of what I was doing and how it was impacting people's lives and that sort of changed my direction forever really wow and so was this something that existed or was a brand new idea? Uh, it's quite standard in the NHS. It's been around for a while. Um, at the time, there was, uh, it was sort of coming towards the end of the last Labour government and um, there was um, uh, an MP called Lord Darcy who had done a review of the NHS and had recommended the kind of expenditure and, and investment that was required. And a big part of that was this public health so it's something that they've always done. It's something that they've recognised. But traditionally, they would get a lot of criticism for this kind of nanny state type messaging where, mm. you know, mother knows best type thing. Mm. But actually, the, the, um, what they call it social marketing. That's, that's what it's called in, in the public sector. Right. Um, not to be confused with social media. No. Um, it is effectively social marketing. It's marketing that is not about simply making a profit because that's not necessarily where your money or your finances come from. Your finances could be um, publicly awarded finances. So you're not looking at um, the, the, the balance sheet at the end of it. You're looking at the impact um, on what you've delivered. And so this, this Darcy review um, gave a lot of encouragement and, and investment also to, to make these things happen. So it was sort of a aligning of the planets, really, in terms of the timing for that. Wow. And did you do that 
than as an employee or as your consultancy? No, as a consultancy. So she was setting up this new team and wasn't looking to bring in substantive staff yet, was just looking to bring in um, contractors and consultants. So it still gave me the chance to have other other clients, mm. but actually it was such an eye-opener for me. And that's that's really what drives me is is being in a world where I'm doing something so new and so exciting mm. that that I, you know, then I'm prepared to commit 80 hours a week without blinking because I think this is, this is, I'm loving this. This is something that I want to do rather mm. than just, oh goodness, it's, it must be five o'clock already. Let me go home. And so did you feel then with that role that she wanted you to do that you had arrived at basically that's the kind of thing I want to do forever or was it I'm just going to do that as a project as a client and I'm going to have other clients do other projects with how, how did that at the time or did it come later um at the time I think I was I was learning so much as I was going that I wasn't really questioning things but I was loving it and and became very aware that the rest of the NHS is structured in a similar way um, and that the opportunity to do more of this was was right there as with all of these things um, uh, change of government change of policy a change of investment meant that a lot of that has has gone away subsequently um, so it wasn't ever going to be a lifetime um, opportunity. Mm. But um, that led me into doing this work with with other parts of the NHS as well and other parts of broader public sector, really. So social housing, excuse me, and that kind of thing where um, actually, uh, again, looking at the impact that it's having on people's lives, but from a, a health and well-being perspective. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and so how long did that last for then with the NHS or is it still ongoing? Occasionally, it's still ongoing, but um, I think my last significant piece of work with them was um, a few years ago now. Um, but that involved um, it was it was working with diabetic patients, helping them manage long term conditions, um, and actually working with employers to help get their employees screened. It was working with um, particular. Um, parts of ethnic communities who are susceptible to diabetes and working with the imams of that community so that they could send out the messages. It was working with Eastern European communities in the UK um, who um, uh, were being encouraged to give up smoking, especially pregnant women, because the messaging, I was told, and this may not be true at all, but I was told that in their home countries, the uh, health messaging that they were given was that if you already smoked when you were pregnant, it was more dangerous to stop than to keep going. Mm. So you mm. just carried on smoking. Mm. Um, and so working with the airlines and things so that when those people were moving between the UK and their home country, they would get the, the these sort of messages advising them that, that wasn't the case at all and that they could come and talk to people in the NHS and, and get smoking cessation advice. It was uh, teenage pregnancy screenings. It was cancer and oncology. So there was a big campaign around um, th the three-week cough, which some of your listeners may remember, um, mm -hmm. that um, it was a, a TV advert and, and print advert that if you'd had a cough for more than three weeks, you could go and talk to your GP about it. Mm -hmm. And actually a big part of developing that campaign was the messages that the person playing the role of the patient in these adverts said, the exact words that they said was pretty much what patients would say when they went to see their GP. So it was giving them permission. It was giving them almost a script to yes. be able to go and have the confidence to raise this issue with um, their GP. So um, increasing all of the screenings for, for lung cancer, um, worked with um changes to healthcare records, all sorts of things that the NHS's 60th birthday, all sorts of things that, mm. that sort of happened. So all of these amazing, amazing campaigns over a number of years that were just incredible. And, and as I say, social housing and things as well, um, that, that just made me feel very, very, it felt like I was doing something worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I think the biggest challenge that exists in society about health and well-being is awareness and there are so many conflicting messages um, 
coming out, and I won't mention them all or examples of them because there are too many to mention. And I, I literally just yesterday I watched a a documentary on Netflix called What the Health, and it's they're very American and they're not really there is a relationship to the UK I'm sure, and a lot of the things that happen in America happen here too, and. Um, but it's a lot of things there that people are just not aware of that are happening, whether it be the food mm. industry or, you know, what, even to the point what GPs are taught in med school, you know. Yep. Uh, um, so it's, it, it is, um, I mean, I've, I've been involved with alternative health since 2004, although I don't practice it now. I did like three years of studies in it. So I have some empathy with this whole sector of creating awareness, you know, because stuff that people just don't know. So, and was it literally, you know, producing literature, doing posters, camp TV, radio campaigns, you were involved in all of these things? Yeah, as I say, I mean, I'm I'm not a particularly creative person, so we'd, mm. we'd usually have agencies and things doing right. anything that, that actually involved visual things for people mm. to look at um but yeah working with ad agencies big big major ad agencies doing tv campaigns so again that was a really interesting insight to see mm. how they work mm. um working with the airlines working with um local authorities um getting involved in um emergency preparedness so uh at the time of various outbreaks mm. of or, or, or rumors of outbreaks of various strains of, of deadly flus and things yes what was the emergency preparedness and actually being part of those um uh, responder teams because they work through um scenario models of so there will, there will be a day where you'll get called up and told this emergency has happened from now on this is not a drill you are you are working on this emergency and so working on some truly horrifying um scenarios but yes. nevertheless working through to work with all of the other blue light responders local authorities the um, environment agency the highways agency all of that kind of thing so really being part just being at the table for some phenomenal conversations and being part of that sort of research seeing what all of these other organizations do which to me is absolutely phenomenal working with healthcare professionals who've got this incredible focused insight and information about their particular area their particular yes. discipline so yeah. again just learning so much it was it was amazing and being able to genuinely feel that I could reassure patients that actually this isn't just some crazy thing I've come up with mm. this is me telling you on behalf of hundreds of people who actually know what they're talking about yes why this is the right thing to do and why this matters wow wow Wow. So that was a big part of your consultancy then. It was. Yeah. It, yeah. What would you say? What, 80 percent of it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, occasionally I did work with other clients as well that weren't mm. involved in, in healthcare. But at, by that point, I uh, I don't know that I had, had got really strict about it in, in contractual terms, mm. but I'd certainly would turn down pieces of work if they didn't if there wasn't something about it that sparked me, if it was just, uh, that sounds terribly dismissive, doesn't it? But if it was someone who just wanted marketing because it would make them money, mm. I, I would struggle to be inspired mm. to do that. If it was someone who was doing something because there was a greater good involved, mm. then then that, that was more likely to drive me. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. And then, <laughs> so that started to peter out a little bit. And, and what, direction did you go in then from there I started and, and I came at this very slowly I'm sure there are lots of people who reached this conclusion um, a lot quicker than I did but um, obviously change of governments and, and change of financing and things meant that uh, a lot of that money started to go away from the NHS because uh, that sort of two-pronged approach for the NHS of educating and treating mm. if you've only got limited amounts of money then you can only treat you, you, you can't spend money educating. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a bigger question for I another know. day. But um, so frustrating because it ends up being much more expensive of course. that way. Um, but anyway, um, so a lot of that money got pulled and, and was then put back into um, treating conditions yeah. uh, rather than, than educating people and supporting people. 
in that time, I'd come to, I'd been working with social housing. I'd been working with a lot of the estates teams of the NHS because, as any of your listeners will know, the NHS estates is, uh, you know, they own hundreds, thousands of properties, probably, um, yeah, around the country. And, and they are all shapes and sizes. So you've got the newest, most high tech of amazing hospitals. You've got dilapidated old buildings somewhere in between. You've got truly, truly terrifying. There was a mental health trust that I work with that has um, a property in, in South London. And it's like, anything you've ever seen from a horror film it's oh, absolutely no. terrifying if you if you didn't have mental health conditions going in you probably would have oh, after you'd been there God. for a while it was it was all turrets and and barred windows it was it was petrifying mm. it was terrifying mm. um but all of that kind of thing and it became clear to me and as i say i came to this quite slowly i think but it became clear to me that the buildings the built environment the space around us actually impacts a huge amount of, of the choices that we make and the people that we become. Mm. And certainly in conditions around uh, or, or sort of um, public health, social marketing around uh, smoking cessation, for example, or um, alcohol, drug intake, um, where the particular demographic that they were focused on, where those people lived and worked, would have a huge impact on on this because there are places and spaces that make you feel less inspired yes. to be the people that you can be. Yes. Um, equally, there are places that outside of your control can cause you all sorts of problems, you know, dark alleyways and, and sort of scary spaces. Mm. Um, but but even sort of sick building syndrome where you've got people who work g good jobs in, in what are, on the face of it, nice shiny buildings mm. that can make you genuinely really ill and the escalation of those conditions can be really quite significant um so uh, one um, of the uh, sorry no very costly as well very very <laughs> because, because if you the, get you get sick people that means your absenteeism costs go through the roof <laughs> and then those people start to take um psychological pressure from that that the stress of it that i i know there's something wrong with me but i can't quite define it so i'm going to keep turning up for work even though i don't feel well mm. because my boss is putting pressure on me or because i genuinely don't want to let my boss down i don't want to let my colleagues down i want to do my bit but that makes your health worse and worse and worse because the longer that you're in those spaces the worse the condition gets um the, the more exposure you have to that um, one of the, the biggest issues that the NHS faces at the moment is a massive rise in mental health problems mm. because people don't tend to present early enough with no. those with those problems. Um, not least because it's quite hard to define. It's hard to put your finger on. If I break my arm, I can go to the doctor and say, this is broken, fix mm. it. And and nobody will question my sanity in doing that. It's It's quite obvious that something is not how it should be. If I just don't feel happy, if I don't feel myself, if I don't feel quite able to cope with life, mm. that's harder to define. And you can easily write that off as I'm just tired, I'm just a bit stressed, I need a holiday. Yes. Um, so people dismiss these these symptoms, these warning symptoms of, of mental health problems. The acoustics in buildings can play a significant part in that. So if you can hear your neighbour switching on their kettle, watching TV, having a row, that is the beginning of neuroses. That's the beginning of low-level mental health problems because mm. the stress, the cortisol levels that that triggers in your body are a real genuine thing. And that could tick along at that level forever. It could escalate into serious mental health problems within a very, very short period of time. Um, and once somebody is... is suffering from significant mental health problems that's it's hard to treat because they then usually become a risk to themselves or yeah. they have to become inpatients and that kind of thing yes. so it, it became obvious to me that if we build better stuff we get better outcomes and yes. that is a it, it's not separate from educating people it's not separate from that sort of public health side but it's a more holistic long-term way of doing things because there are other countries that don't make the same design choices that we make or that make worse design choices that we make and we can learn from each other we can there's no reason we have to keep making the same mistakes wow <laughs> so okay 
So what are you doing in that space? Well, what? Um, so having having come to this from a remarkably <laughs> late revelation, um, I started, I, I sort of came full circle and kind of went back to construction um, mm. employers as, as a, a sector and became very aware about the skills gap mm. that they're struggling with that as of today's date, at any given time, there are about 230,000 jobs in, NH- in construction that they cannot fill because they don't have the skilled people to do it. Wow. Um, now, there's there's all manner, once you unpick that, there's all manner of reasons for that. Um, some of these skills are historic and have been replaced by other skills, but just employers don't necessarily want to invest in the technology. Some of those skills are very soft skills. They're, they're people skills, which is just a generational difference, really, of what a boss might expect from a, a millennial um, employee. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of those things. And, and the, the overarching thing for me was if there are this few people in construction, if, there's, if the gap is this significant and will continue to grow with, with Brexit and recessions and, and all of the things that inevitably come about. Yeah. Um, we're going to end up building lousy stuff mm. because we'll just build the stuff that is cheap and quick and we can get it done and make a good profit margin on it without thinking about the consequences of those those places. Mm. Um, and so my work now is with with employers, with schools, with educators to genuinely talk about careers in construction, not because I care about construction particularly as a sector. I, I, you know, some days I don't even like them. No. But because if we build better stuff, we get better outcomes. And I think that's a really strong message for young people to understand that their perception of where they are, their perception of their environment is real, it's true, it's genuine, it's valid. However you feel about a space is absolutely fine if you want to make it better come and join the sector that's responsible for making it better make sure nobody else has to put up with that okay so let me try and play this back to you then so it's it's so it's not going around telling construction companies you've got to build build better stuff because of these reasons it's more about starting where you can make a longer term impact with the young people, encouraging them to go into construction because there is a shortage of people, but educating them that when you do go in, you've got to influence better stuff to be built. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that pretty much summarises it. I, I do work with some construction employers um, around their own projects about how they might improve things. Mm. But I, I only know what I know. My, I, you know, I don't come from a technical construction background, mm. um, and so my my knowledge there is is purely subjective. I I want young people who want to make a difference in the world to understand that construction actually is one of the most dynamic sectors in order to do that. Probably more so, more of a daily impact on people's lives than healthcare or finance, because it can impact you while you're sleeping. It can change the way you physically and mentally feel about every single aspect of your lives, every, every moment of every day. Mm. Um, it's the, the, the significance of the sector cannot be understated to my mind. But at the moment, construction goes into schools and says, hey, do you want to be a quantity surveyor? Do you want to be a truck driver mm-hmm. um and it, it, for kids that that's it's very hard to link that to anything not only what is a quantity surveyor mm. um, who would know um but unless you understand why people are doing those jobs it's very hard to imagine why you'd want to um so yeah i take it back that that stage to say this matters look around you this has consequences if you like it if you don't like it that's that's absolutely valid. Yeah. If it makes you feel unwell, if it makes you feel unsafe, if it makes you unhappy, those are real genuine feelings. Yeah. You can come and be part of making it better. And as the world, because children are naturally more ideological anyway, um, all of the messaging around the significance of the environmental impact is is also a really important part of that. The, the world is running out of resources. We can't just keep building stuff because that's how we've always done it. Mm. 
we're going to have to come up with other ways of doing things. Yeah. Fascinating. And then, so is this now, um, you know, is, is this now your consultancy that you're de delivering these to young people and then people in construction? How, how does that manifest in terms of um, paid work for you? Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is this is the business now that I run. So it takes all sorts of different guises because I still have the opportunity to be a little bit flexible with that. And also because I know better than to sort of stitch myself into a corner of, of just doing um, a limited amount of things. Um, so I, I teach. I teach BTEC construction. Um, because I wanted to see the world from from a teacher's point of view, and that helps me a lot with employers to be able to uh, explain very clearly what goes on um, in the classroom and how they can help be part of that and influence that. Um, I also work with the Careers and Enterprise Company, who are a big government um, arm's length body or yeah. however these things work, um, who are responsible for providing this kind of support into schools, but also they are a very well-resourced research team. So they actually research and evidence what works in careers, what works in, in um, influencing and supporting young people in right. their career choices. Um, they have released a number of different research um, reports and evidence um, around the effectiveness of different things so careers fairs and assembly talks and that kind of thing so employers can really get very factual evidence about this isn't particularly effective mm. but if you do lots of it it'll be great this is very effective but it's hugely time consuming so you've got to commit to it kind of thing um they've also uh, careers and enterprise company have been able to release various very impactful statistics um one of which is is a real eye-opener for a lot of employers that four or more high quality interactions with an employer during your time in education reduces the chance of being neat that is not in education employment or training yes. for young people by 86 percent which statistically speaking is a dead cert mm -hmm. i mean 86 percent is is as close as you can get without all of the other um life factors there and if we as employers can't provide four opportunities for children then really what are we doing with yeah. ourselves we can you know that's there's no reason not to do that um so i work with employers um i do a lot of education and do workshops and training to help them understand what goes on in education how that works the pressures that teachers are facing the benchmarks and the requirements the regulations that schools have to deliver so from an employer's point of view you don't try and reinvent the wheel this is what you need to do this is what schools need you to do just get on and do it and then once you're doing it how can you actually improve that and, and um, influence it make it make it more um, bespoke to, to the schools that you're working with um, I, I also work with um, a number of different um, construction related media who run um, exhibitions and events so alongside those events will run a construction careers week for the schools in that particular geography um, that tie in with the exhibition that give children the chance to go to site visits and go and visit employers and get an insight into things. So we give them that sort of immersive experience yeah. as well. So it, it plays out in a number of different ways, but effectively the end goal is I want children to understand these opportunities, but I want employers to be better. I want them to do what needs to be done rather than just sort of fighting it because unfortunately construction does have a little bit of a sort of victim mentality that we can't solve anything for ourselves we need other people to solve it for us because this skills gap has actually been in place for comfortably 25 years wow if not if not more um and if people really wanted to solve that they would have so in behaviour change terms, that's not a problem. That's actually just a characteristic. That's just a person, you know, part of yeah. who they are as a sector. Um, and young people see that. They they know that if a sector has that kind of skills gap, it means that it's not a very appealing sector. Um, so helping in any way that I can to kind of bring the two parties together. Right. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so, well, thank you for that explanation. It, it does sound complicated and it sounds like a massive, you know, massive mission that you're on. <laughs> and are you are you the only one of its kind out there doing this kind of stuff, or have you got a team of people, uh, other you know agencies or individuals doing similar things? How, how do you see it? I think I'm the only person tackling it in exactly this way, but there are hundreds, hundreds of organisations that are doing certainly things to do with careers and, and supporting of schools. Um, lots and lots of organisations exist to do that. And if any of your listeners are keen to get into schools and to support that, I would say go and talk to those organisations first because schools will not thank you for going in as individuals. They, mm. they haven't got time to respond to that. Um, there are other people in construction because this skills gap is is so prevalent. There are lots of people doing various things um, to to tackle that. There are lots of people helping um, people coming from from the armed forces to come and join construction. People with disabilities, young people, women, all of that kind of thing. There are a lot of organisations yes. um, doing things like that. So I am constantly surrounded by people who are on a similar mission and I think that in in itself is very inspiring standing shoulder to shoulder with people who may not be achieving exactly the end goal that you are but who ultimately want to do better stuff mm. that's that's very inspiring for me and so I can choose to be around those people which again gives me the flexibility to keep myself sort of uplifted um, and, and inspired rather than dragged down into the day-to-day -day of nonsense so so do you earn a wage from the kind of schools, the educational bodies, the construction companies are sponsoring you to do this or how does it work for you, Catherine? I'm worried that you are <laughs> earning enough in this. <laughs> I don't think I'm earning enough either. I think there's, there's plenty <laughs> more, but uh, you know, um, no, it, yes, I, I do. I, I'm, I'm a paid lecturer. I'm a paid um, tutor. I'm, mm. I'm, paid by by employment uh, um, construction employers mm. um i am funded by sort of government bodies that mm. do um careers type things so the the finances come from a number of different sources oh, good. um good but it, it, it i i think for me one of the, my goals for this year is really to do more of the training and education for employers yes so that they they just do better stuff when they go into schools because I think patching up that relationship and making that smoother and easier makes everybody's life better. Yeah. And so that's, that's really where my, my focus for the revenue is this year. But um, as with all of these things, I think, you know, certainly any government money is, it's great while it's there, but you shouldn't really rely on it, it being doesn't there last. No. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we can be sure about, it doesn't last. Yeah. No. So, so, Doing the, the kind of training in employers, when you talk employers, we're talking construction companies. Yes, yeah, specific. I, I mean, it, it's the, the breadth of construction and that is a very, very broad sector. So that's yes. engineering, that's demolition, that's the whole um, property management, the mm. whole spectrum of the built environment. Yeah. But but yes, broadly, that's that's my particular focus. Obviously, there's nothing to say that this is not relevant to other sectors, mm. but other sectors might pitch their message differently and yeah. what they want to say to schools and to, yeah. to young people. Got it. I think I've got it. It sounds complicated <laughs> and I don't envy you with your mission, but it sounds like you're the right person. It certainly is not going to get you bored. <laughs> no, no. This time last year, I was actually sitting with um, my, my chairman. I have a, a number of people who form my board who mm. are people from construction who have very kindly given up their time to support and encourage me because they believe in what I'm doing. Yes. Um, and I was giving my chairman this update on on where I was, what was happening and all of these frustrations and things that were bothering me. And he was just sitting there with his wry smile on his face. <laughs> and I said, why are you smiling? He said, well, if it was easy, you wouldn't be doing it. Yes. And I thought, that's actually very true. If it was easy, I'd be bored by now. Yeah. So the fact that it's difficult is what makes it so inspiring oh, for me. Well done. Well done. <laughs> okay, I'm, go I'm going to... So, so sorry for keep delving into this. I'm, I'm going to go back to more, a little bit more general questions uh, to go in a higher level now. So 
as you know, the reason for this podcast is to inspire people to, you know, to get started on their own, basically, and perhaps get into this sector. But um, what would you say, because obviously you've changed direction and you've just kind of alluded to it, that things aren't always that easy. What what have some of the challenges been for you in running your own business? But also balance that. So give us also some of the highlights at the same time. Uh, okay. Um, I, some of the challenges certainly for me in terms of my personality is that I I can be a little bit flighty. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I like the next new thing so I can go through months months and months and months in securing a piece of work and then once i've got it um I'm, I'm i'm kind of bored of it because i've spent months talking about it thinking about it exploring it doing everything about it mm. um and and that can be quite tough for me but um i think that's that's really who i am as a person but yeah. I, I i would say at a more more general level to people who are looking to maybe make these changes in their life. If you find something that inspires you, the stuff that's tricky won't seem like such a challenge mm. because y you'll want to do it. Every time you think about it, you'll think, no, do you know what? I, I know how to solve this. Let's get on and solve it. And, and you'll overcome um, the problems. I think the highlights for me, uh, uh, for me personally, is that I, I find myself having conversations with people who absolutely take my breath away people who are extraordinary and inspiring and knowledgeable and wise and can tell you things that will change your outlook on life from that moment forward mm. and and that is something that I absolutely love so I I can make the choice to be around those people or to, to move in those circles, which is something which is such a huge gift to yeah. me. That that is to me that is more than the money. That is just the chance to to be around people that that are so incredible. Um but also the the, the wins when you when you get something done, uh, you know, when I talk to young people and see the sort of light bulb switch on that actually I could do this. I could make this better. There's nothing that beats that. Yeah. That is an incredible experience. Oh, lovely. I, I think those are some really great points. And, you know, it's true about the challenges. And in the challenge that you, the example you've set there is very, very true because actually they often say it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Mm. And actually the journey is the most exciting part of of anything. <laughs> so if you're trying to get a piece of business, the journey of getting it is actually the exciting bit. Once you've landed it, you kind of go, okay, now I've got to do it. Uh, <laughs> I've got to deliver it. Okay, now the boring stuff starts, you know. Um, and, but I think, you know, to, to respond to that, I would say, yeah, once you've delivered that piece and then have to go and get another piece, that's another new journey that you've got to undertake. And I suppose you've explained also your personality and what you said earlier about that you, you can get bored. And I think most people are very similar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we can all get bored. That's why people get bored. The people that are listening to this that are in jobs now they are bored. They want to get yeah. out. You know, they want to do something else. They wanted to get in the job, but now, now they're in it. They're kind of going, I really want to get out now, you know, and, but they don't know what else to do. Okay. So thank you for that. And I, I would love to talk about another piece of your journey. And I, I, I um, I didn't prepare you for this. So if you don't <laughs> want to talk about it, you don't have to, but I'm sure you will. So about 18 months ago, we met and you're a friend. We have a mutual friend and we'll give him a shout out, Richard Tubb. Um, hey, Richard. Hey, Richard. He's, <laughs> way, he's even further away from you than he is from me now, up in the Northeast. Um, and uh, so we miss him. And we all met at uh, TEDx Brum. Uh, so this is for people that don't know, go and check out TED Talks or TED.com and you'll see some amazing talks by people. 
And you mentioned something to us all there and that you said, I want to speak here at TEDx Brum. And the following year, you did. Yay. <laughs> so how did you manage that? <laughs> um, I think I have to give full credit there to the absolutely extraordinary and incredible Imi Core. So for people who, who don't know TEDx Brum and, and who don't know Imi, um, I would absolutely recommend that you check out the Impact Hub in Birmingham. Imi runs that and she is this tiny powerhouse of of extraordinary and incredible. You know you're in her presence. She's quite remarkable. And she held the license for Telex Brum. Um, so she was the person who organized it. Yes. Um, last year, 2017, was her, her final year of doing that. So it'll be someone else who picks up the license now. Right. Um, but I, I have known Imi for a couple of years uh, in various different guises. And so as a result of TEDx 2016, I went to a couple of the um, events that they held at the Impact Hub after after the TED Talk yes. with various people who'd been speaking and got involved in lots of debate, debates and conversations and, and exercises and things where we looked at how we might actually go about solving some of these problems and, and addressing things um, and carried on going to, to those kind of things. So when Imi put out the call for speakers... Um, for 2017's TEDx, the focus was around perspectives mm. and she wanted people who were coming at issues from their own perspective, regardless of whether that was the agreed perspective, whether that's the mainstream perspective, but but coming at it with your own point of view and having a very clear point of view. Um, and she and I have talked at length about the the redevelopment of cities and that sort of segregation of of not just communities, but of wealth and opportunity. Um, and so she asked me if I would like to pitch to, to be one of the speakers, and I did. Um, and, and the rest is history. Oh, brilliant. And I will definitely include a link to your talk as well in the show notes so people go and find out and learn a little bit more about your mission and your message. And, yeah, it was brilliant and it was so amazing to – you know, you, you set your intention there and it happened within 12 months, which was, I was just gobsmacked. It was fantastic <laughs> to witness. So well done you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Catherine, I, I know I could speak for much longer with you about many other topics, but I, I don't want to make this in a marathon kind of podcast. So we're going to come to a close, but before we do, um, and you have already given a bit, but I'm going to tease another little bit out of you. So if there was one bit of advice that you would give an aspiring business owner, what advice would that be? Um, I, I think I would say be, be true to yourself. I, I don't mean that as some sort of flippant throwaway line. I mean, really know who you are, what, what drives you, what inspires you, what, what pressures you, what makes you miserable mm. and, and be okay with all of those things. Setting up a business on your own is not the time to try and change who you are as a person. Mm. Um, do the things that make you happy. Try to not do the things that make you miserable. Um, and, and be okay with that. Um, if you're, goal is simply money, then you may have missed the fundamentals of what makes you happy um, as, as a sort of throwaway remark. Yes. But I think there's in the early days of running a business, you are unlikely to be buying yourself yachts. It's important that you can find other ways to inspire yourself, that there's enough driving you to get out of bed in the morning and to go and do the things that you want to do. So it, it's got to be something more fundamental mm. than that. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very important. And it's something that most people, I, I perhaps didn't realize that when I went into it. I, I got a little bit of that, but it's also an ongoing journey, isn't it? That part. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. you don't kind of, you know, be true to yourself and then kind of go, okay, I know what I want. I know my passion. I know what I'm here for. 
because it evolves, it changes, and it, it and you've got to be flexible, I think, as well. And and in that you can, in a way that doesn't damage your business or that that you know sort of punishes you financially yeah. you can start to get quite confident in the people that you choose not to be around the the projects that you choose not to take and the the work that you choose not to do because certainly something i i have learned over time and and people will often say is if you really have to work hard to convince someone that they want to work with you and you have to struggle to get paid and things those are not clients that you're ever going to enjoy working for no. It's uh, it, th- there's there's an amount of work involved in persuading people, and then there's an amount of work of just saying this is we're not right for each other. Mm. Let's let's not do this. And often, what can happen is is when you stop something to say this isn't right, another opportunity or door will open that will be better. But if you block block it by taking on work that you don't enjoy then that other stuff won't come your way so it's having that faith really to know well something better will come along and something that's right for me will come along and that's often hard if you've come from uh, an experience of being an employee Mm. that those kind of things are slightly outside of your control the clients that your company work with or the people that you have to deal with they just are what they are yeah. and you 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 lose that sort of sense of agency that you are able to influence that and to choose that so that can be really quite a a learning curve when you're doing this for yourself that you don't have to deal with people like that if you don't want to no no thank you very good so my very 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 last question then is <laughs> how can people get in touch with you if you would like them to and and where can they locate you or follow you and what you're talking about I would love them to get in touch. Um, my my website is BE Skills in Schools. That is Built Environment Skills in Schools. So the letter B, the letter E, skills in schools.co.uk. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Best Program. I'm on um, YouTube as Best Program. On YouTube, I also have a TV channel called Best TV. That is B E W S TV, where we have all sorts of programs and interviews and things for employers and for teachers um, for classroom and curriculum information so if people want to watch those if people want to contribute to those that would be fantastic Um, if people are looking to go and support schools and and actually talk to young people please get in touch there as well Um, I can put you in touch with organizations that can help you to do that and to get you into schools and if you're not thinking about going into schools then you should because young people need your help and support Mm. Um, and also as part of my research if people have got thoughts and ideas on the built environment and and how it works I'd love to hear from you. Fantastic well I will definitely include all those in the show notes and they can find you and follow you and watch your programs absolutely brilliant thank you so much Catherine for joining me and speaking to me and if you are next time you're back up in the midlands please give us a shout out and i'll buy you a coffee (laughs) and if i'm down in london i'll give you a shout out and i'll still buy you coffee (laughs) (laughs) fantastic thank you so much for having me as a guest michael i really appreciate it take care catherine bye for now thanks bye staying alive uk share your story 